All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I think a couple people will still kind of join as we as we get started, but I want to make sure, you know, time conscious. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're going to be talking about PFAS protection and legislation today. Um, this is kind of our Water Wednesday series. This is the first one of the year. Um, we've done lots of others in the years, a couple of years previous or on our YouTube channel and online, if you're curious at looking at kind of the other subjects and topics that we've covered um, from our work to, you know, things going on legislatively, et cetera. Um, so my name is Emily Silence. I am the development officer at Potomac Riverkeeper Network. Um, unfortunately, though, only for a couple more days, I'm actually leaving the organization. So this will be my last Water Wednesday, which I'm very sad about. Um, but it'll be taken on by someone else, and I'm sure it'll, they'll do great things. Um, so just a little housekeeping. Um, everyone is muted for right now. Just as you all know, it's easiest to do on Zoom. Um, feel free to type in the chat if you have any questions. Um, we do have some time set aside at the end for specifically answering any questions, but you know, if you do want to talk in the chat at all. Um, I want to introduce our speakers today. So um, we got with us Brent Walls, who was our Upper Potomac Riverkeeper, um, Betsy Nicholas, who is our Vice President of Programs, and Matt Fluta, who is the Chop Tank Riverkeeper. Um, thanks guys for joining us. Um, so just a little bit about PRKN, Potomac Riverkeeper Network, before we get started. Um, we work to protect and preserve the Potomac and the Shenandoah rivers. Um, we work through litigation, enforcement, um, and advocacy. So those are our main kind of tools in the belt that we use. Um, there are many programs that we work through. So our water quality monitoring program, mm -hmm. um, our uh, Trash Free Potomac campaign, we have Trash Free Shenandoah, uh, and lots of other kind of campaigns in the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac as well too. Um, that we work through. And then, of course, our litigation work, so our enforcement work. So we actually go after the polluters, right? That's a big part of our work um, and a big part of being a riverkeeper. So, you know, if we see a pollution sale, see some, see some kind of issue in the watershed, um, we will right the wrong, right? We'll go after them and correct it, whether that's through some kind of advocacy um, or if it's through litigation, um, that as well. Um, we work through uh, four states and then Washington, D.C., so Maryland, Virginia, a little bit of West Virginia and a little bit of Pennsylvania and the district. So where our kind of watershed is, as you can see, um, probably on this map. Um, and yeah, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, Brent, if you want to. Already. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's, it's, we couldn't have done these water Wednesdays without you, Emily. And, and actually, I think it was your idea to do all of these. So um, I'm not sure how we're going to accomplish them when you're gone, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out. <clears throat> So um, just gonna try and figure out why my, oh, there it is. All right, so just real quick agenda. Um, I'm gonna cover, just kind of go back to the basics. What is PFOS? Um, and then Matt Pluta, who director of Riverkeeper Programs at Shore Rivers is gonna talk about PFOS and biosolids in Maryland. And then um, Betsy Nicholas, our vice president of programs, she's going to kind of cover the legislation on PFOS, uh, mostly in Maryland, but uh, generally in, in Virginia as well. So, with yeah, there we go. So, you know, PFOS basically alphabet soup, uh, lots and lots of terms and lots and lots of letters. And it's a really hard subject to kind of wrap our heads around. And I kind of want to go back to the beginning a little bit. Um, about what PFOS is. It stands for polyfluoroalkaline substances. As substances, there is so far that I know of uh, 12,000 man made chemicals, and I think that number might be going up. Um, but the last I saw was 12,000 uh, chemicals. And, you know, we think of these as a family of pollutants, although there are, you know, a, a number of individual pollutants, some are more potent than others. We really want to start addressing. Uh, PFOS is a family whenever it's legislation uh, or even um, in drinking water standards or bans. And, you know, and PFOS has been around for a long time. Uh, they started manufacturing PFOS chemicals in the 1940s. So it is, it is, it is around, it's been around, it is worldwide. Uh, the two particular ones of, of interest uh, of late um, and probably the most the two most toxic ones, PFOA and PFOS. Um, PFOA is also known as C8. It was produced by 3M. It was one of the main ingredients in uh, for AFFF firefighting foam. <clears throat> PFOS 
it, you know, it was produced by electrochemical fluorination, EF, ECF. Uh, and this, you know, it essentially is how they are able to uh, attach this chemical to various different metals um, for waterproofing, and which I'll get into into the next slide. If it goes, there we go. Um, so what kind of chemical is PFOS? Well, so, you know, it's, it's, it's this um, extremely strong fluorine and carbon bond. That's really what makes this a particular potent um, pollutant. And uh, this fluorine carbon bond is, comes in several different chains. You can see PFOA and PFOS there. And you have a head group that's on this molecule and a tail group. Now the tail group is where your carbon and fluorine atoms are. Uh, it does not like water. And the head group likes water. So whatever that head group compound is, it likes the water. And so that's exactly one of the reasons why this chemical is so prolific in our environment, because it can attach to water molecules and flow and be transported by groundwater, surface water, uh, and the like. Now the hydrophobic, the part that doesn't like water, that's an important feature because when that head group is attached to some other material, whether it's a Gore-Tex or Scotchgard or um, T-Fell, like in pans, that tail group acts as a uh, waterproofing agent. And not only does that tail group hydrophobic, it's also lipophobic, which means it doesn't like the fats. And that's exactly why um, the chemicals are used in T-Fells and other metals to kind of waterproof. It doesn't like the fats and you can cook your bacon without it sticking. Uh, and that's, you know, until it starts to leach away after a while, it's have those nice little scratches. <clears throat> but the big properties here, heat resistant, extremely heat resistant, uh, high foaming uh, surfactants, and that allows um, one AFFF to work. It blocks out the oxygen and so it can suffocate a fire. But that surfactant is also in so many other different chemicals and it allows um, other proprietary chemicals within that surfactant to do its job. And a lot of times that can involve insecticides and pesticides and herbicides. It acts as an insulator. Again, we've already talked about repellent or waterproofing, and it just does not easily break down. Um, so just kind of comprehending the size of what we're talking about, uh, which is, you know, a little mind boggling. It, you know, we're talking about one part per trillion, parts per trillion, and, you know, one drop of water uh, of this, one drop of this pollutant in, uh, is equivalent um, to uh, one parts per trillion to 20 Olympic sized pools. So for one drop of this pollutant, 20 Olympic sized pools, that's about how small we're looking at. You can see the other graphic down there where you have uh, parts per hundred, parts per thousand, parts per million, parts per parts per billion, and then parts per trillion, and the incremental size that it's involved there. And that just kind of puts you in, into perspective uh, the size of this chemical, that, that's how small it is. And then, you know, we're always getting reports from several different places in various different uh, nomenclatures, milligrams, micrograms, nanograms, MG slash L, UG slash L. And so it's really important to try and understand those variations and how you can determine and, and talk about the PFOS at these uh, levels. And then I wanted to make a note you know, looking at these levels, EPA drinking water health advisories back in 2016 was 70 parts per trillion. Uh, and that's a combination of PFOA and PFOS combined, which, you know, as you can see there, 0 0.07 parts per billion and uh, a lot of zeros in front of us, um, you know, behind the, that decimal point for parts per million. You know, and so that's how small we're, we're talking. But in 2022, this is even crazier. Uh, EPA came out with the health advisors for drinking water, PFOA and PFOS. PFOA, 0 0.004 parts per trillion. So that's extremely small. I mean, that's that's not even a drop of water. Um, you know, and so it, we're really talking about small amounts that have potential uh, long lasting impacts um, to our environment and to our bodies. Uh, what kind of pollutant is PFOS? Uh, well, you know, one of the really big issues 
is the bioaccumulation factor. This stuff will accumulate. It'll it'll magnify in our bodies and in the in the, in the environment and various different um, terrestrial and aquatic species. You know, it attaches to our blood and our tissues. It likes the uh, the proteins in our blood. Um, it doesn't break down. Uh, it just really does not break down in the environment. There are really no microbial biological um, breakdown um, ability for, for PFOS chemicals. And that's why it can uh, quickly and easily go through uh, the ground via groundwater. Um, and it's also been known to reform a wastewater treatment plants. What does that mean? Well, you know, we start looking at shorter chain fluorinated carbons you know, thinking, oh, well, it's not as potent. It's going to be a shorter chain. Well, those shorter chains in an environment with a lot of other shorter chains, like in a uh, treatment plant, um, have been known to reform into those longer chains. And so then we're still going to be discharging uh, the more potent um, PFOS into our rivers and streams. You know, this stuff absorbs in the plants and the crops um, because of water uptake from the crops, and it can get into our grains that we use for our various different foods. Uh, I already said it that, you know, it can easily move through groundwater. It accumulates in aquatic species by attaching to proteins, and it's linked to a number of different problems. Kidney cancer, testicular cancer, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, uh, and birth defects. Um, you know, it's we all are going to have a level of PFOS in our system. And I predict sometime down the road that you're going to go to the doctor's office, you're going to get a blood test to check out your cholesterol, and they're going to want a PFOS measure as well, just to find out because PFOS is linked to high cholesterol. So if you have higher amounts of PFOS in your system, you may well, you know, um, already have high cholesterol because of that connection, not just because of the foods that you eat. How are we exposed to PFAS chemicals? Well, number one uh, exposure is through drinking water. And that's why uh, EPA does have right now just a guidance, a health advisory guidance for the public water systems. Uh, and they are pushing for um, drinking water standards. There are several states out there that do have drinking water standards um, as we speak. And it's a push for the federal government to do the same so that all states are required to have those same standards. But what are the standards? That's going to be the difficulty. Food products, milk, beef, seafood, vegetables, because it just can be uptake through the environment and in, 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 you know, in our seafood swimming around in, in the waters and streams. And I was just thinking about this today. I'm not really sure what the PFOS levels are in the ocean. Uh, so, you know, that's something I haven't even looked into, but it's um, kind of scratching my head on that one. Packaging of food products. I think that is an, a big one here in Maryland. Last year, we did uh, push through legislation that banned PFOS uh, in food packaging uh, for uh, various different products. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, your McDonald's wrappers, that waterproofing paper, it's got PFOS in it. Personal care products, uh, anything that we apply onto our skin that has waterproofing um, kind of components to it, that has PFOS. Cookware, another big one, we're cooking in TFL or any kind of um, uh, material, Cathlon or whatever it is that goes onto your pots and pans, that has some form of PFOS in it. And you wouldn't believe it, but household dust has PFOS. If you have carpets with stain resisting products on it or your couches of Scotch Guard on it, and that dust can emit into the air and we're gonna breathe in that dust. Uh, and then again, exposure um, through AFFF, this is mostly concerning our firefighters out there and our military folks. So, you know, what is the PFOS cycle? And this is kind of what I've been kind of honing. We really have to try and figure out how to throw a wrench into the cycle. <clears throat> and you know how this works is the PFOS cycle is produced, you know, it has been produced and is in all of these different products. We use these products um, and then we wash them down the drain. It goes into our treatment plants. Treatment plants become another source. It goes into our rivers and our streams. Our rivers and our streams are impacted uh, with all these the PFOS chemicals. And then, you know, we get our drinking water from the rivers and streams. And so that it goes right back into the drinking water and drinking water facilities don't have the ability to filter out PFOS most of the time. Uh, you know, and so we have this constant cycle. We have bile cells that are coming from the wastewater treatment plants put in the farm fields, um, being uptaken by crops and then run off into the groundwater and into our stream. So it's this constant perpetual cycle that we have to try and figure out how we can put stop gaps 
in all of these um, components. It's not as easy to just stop producing the products because PFOS is already out there in so many products as it is right now. Um, and so it's trying to figure out a way to put all these little stops uh, in the PFOS cycle. And I think it, that's pretty much it for me. Um, the next slide is about some, uh, um, some legislation that Betsy will cover, but I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna turn it over to Matt Pluta and he is gonna cover um, biosolids. Great, thanks, Brent. Um, thanks for that great segue. I think you know, the, the PFAS life cycle there really shows you know, the variety of ways that this pollution can get into, or this contaminant can get into our environment. And I think that's what I've been thinking a lot about lately is what are the pathways for PFAS to enter the environment. And so a little bit of background, I'm, I'm from the Eastern shore of Maryland. So primarily a rural, rurally dominated watershed. And you wouldn't think of that as being a place for, for PFAS contamination, considering what Brent said from the manufacturing side. But then when you get down into how these products are being used, um, where some of the waste streams are being disposed of, I think that really hits the nail on the head in terms of um, how we might be seeing PFAS contamination accelerated here in a rural watershed like the Eastern Shore. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some of the considerations for PFAS contamination in such a rural watershed. And a quick overview of my presentation, give you a short um, uh, overview of who we are at Shore Rivers, talk about um, what the Eastern Shore looks like and why we characterize it as a rural watershed, and then get into some of the examples that we're seeing here on the Eastern Shore, as well as elsewhere around the country um, related to some of the testing that's being done as well. And so real quick, if you aren't familiar with Shore Rivers, we're a riverkeeper organization like the Potomac Riverkeeper Network. We're located on the Eastern Shore and we cover these four watersheds that you can see here, sort of the middle and the upper shore um, region. Um, we do this with a huge team, um, over 25 staff, three offices and four departments that we work through. And um, I'd be at fault if I didn't take this time to let this group know we're hiring. Um, we've got a lot of open positions, some of which are actually due today. But if you're interested in this type of work um, and doing these types of advocacy and outreach um, um, activities like we're doing today, please head over to shorerivers.org and check out the positions that we have open. All right, shameless plug over. So when I talk about land use on the Eastern Shore, um, there's no better example than the Chop Tank River itself. Um, the Chop Tank River, as you can see here, is predominantly agriculture. It runs about 60% agricultural land use, um, dropping down as forest, then, then less, less percentage of that is developed. And then finally, we have um, a small percentage of wetlands that are still remaining. And this is significant because this, this is what the Eastern Shore looks like, really. It's low-lying land with a lot of agricultural land, um, forested wetlands in between there, and then dotted small towns um, throughout the way. I like this map a little bit, same watershed, Chop Tank River Basin here. And what I like about this is it shows where our wastewater treatment plant outfalls are. And so we don't have what the state would consider major wastewater treatment plants. Um, here in the watershed. And so we're not necessarily seeing the, the pretreatment of chemical industries that are discharging into our wastewater systems that you would see on the Western shore. Um, and we're, mostly our wastewater treatment plants are dealing with residential waste um, coming through there. Um, also significant on the Eastern shore are um, the efforts to Restore oysters, the oyster industry, um, everything dealing with commercial fishing really takes a uh, front and center seat here on the Eastern shore. This is a map on the right-hand side showing all of the uh, oyster harvesting areas. And you can see the, the dominance that it has over on the Eastern shore. And I'll point out too that um, the, the five large scale, of the five large scale um, sanctuary, oyster restoration sanctuaries, three of those are within the chop tank. And so those are areas where a lot of um, resources have been put into restoring oysters on a very large scale. And um, I'll, I'll come back to this oyster thing later in my talk and, and talking about sort of the relevance here with the potential for PFAS contamination. But when you think about the Eastern Shore, you know, farming, oysters, fishing, hunting, all of those sort of rural based industries are front and center and um, pose a, a huge impact when, when we're talking about the, the forever chemical leaching into the environment. 
And then lastly, I'll point out that the Eastern Shore is under sort of intense development pressure as a result of the pandemic. And we're seeing a lot of people moving out here. So a lot of land is being converted from agricultural land, forest land to residential developments. And of course, as we talk about wastewater treatment plants, you know, accumulating these PFAS, we're gonna see our wastewater treatment plants getting bigger um, and potentially more ways of wastewater, wastewater being managed over here. So I wanna sort of walk you through the history of PFAS on the Eastern shore in the sense of what monitoring has been done and then sort of the, the red flags or the alarms that have been triggered to me um, that's sort of one step removed from, from the monitoring that's been done. And I'll show you, show you why that is. So first I'll just say there's been very limited monitoring on the Eastern shore that I'm aware of um, from a, a state and federal perspective. And then also from you know, groups like ours who've done some testing. But I remember reading this report, I wanna say it was probably 2019, um, somebody on the call could probably correct me if they've seen this, but this was MDE's, one of their first efforts, uh, Maryland Department of the Environment's first effort to monitor PFAS in fish tissue. And I thought it was pretty significant here that they noted that of all the samples they collected on the Eastern shore, um, none of the results showed levels of concern in the fish there. So I said to myself, wow, we must have it made. You know, our fish are doing okay over here. But then I started hearing more things going on around the country, which I'll get into in just a minute, that sort of, again, triggered some, some alarms for me. Uh, we also did some PFOS monitoring in-house here. We were curious to know if one of the few industrial facilities that we have here on the Eastern Shore, which is an animal rendering facility, if they were discharging PFOS. And so this is a a rendering plant that takes organic material, so um, byproducts from the poultry industry primarily, and renders them down and, and discharges under a, a state permit. And what we found coming out of this organic source, if you'll categorize it as that, is essentially non-detects for the, the limited number of PFAS that we, that we tested. I will admit that we didn't do the full suite of um, analysis that's out there now, but in the limited number that we did, we didn't get any, any um, results. So then the water keepers band together, um, Brent over there in the upper Potomac, my colleagues over here on the Eastern shore and all the water keepers really around the country underwent our nationwide PFOS monitoring study. And on the Eastern shore, we, we took samples um, at these locations you see here um, in each of the watersheds. And those locations are significant. I'll point out in the chop tank, we were testing directly at the outfall of a municipal wastewater treatment plant that is primarily um, residentially fed um, residential wastewater. The, the sample collected on the Y River there was downstream of a um, wastewater spray irrigation field. And so one of the more, I, say, I would say growing in popularity, one of the methods that are growing in popularity in terms of disposing of wastewater in, the, in a rural area is spray irrigation. And so that's taking the treated effluent and spraying it on farm fields um, with the understanding that plants will take up some of the extra nutrients that are associated with that wastewater. Um, so we wanted to see what was going on downstream from these spray irrigation fields. And then the Chester River, that sample was collected um, downstream of an area that it was an equestrian center, um, a saloon and spa. So, so the personal care products was a potential source um, and I think that was it up there. And then the Sassafras River was um, near a marina and a boat building yard, uh, as well as a wastewater treatment facility. And I'll just show real quick to orient you to the results that we have here. Each river is broken out in a square and you'll see the, the detections on the upstream side, uh, on the left hand of those boxes and on the right hand, you'll see the downstream. And it was, it was very interesting, I'll say, this first round of testing for us, because it did open our eyes that, okay, maybe we don't have PFOS showing up in the fish that are being tested, but is it getting into the environment? And the answer there was absolutely. And so we see here, specifically on the Chop Tank River, which is the one I'm most familiar with, um, you can see we've had pretty high levels. Now, these results are, are in parts per trillion. As Brent pointed out in his chart, it's that bottom level reading. Um, that's really fine to the detail. And we were getting results of 14.6 parts per trillion in one for one um, PFOS constituent. And then you can see some elevated results elsewhere. Um, so again, this was 
sort of a trigger to us that there is PFAS getting into the environment from some of these sources, um, primar primarily some of the wastewater sources that were tested in the lower part of our region. So looking at potential pathways for PFAS contamination, I thought I'd break it down into sort of these three sources. So we, we talk about wastewater treatment plants as a pathway, but I think we have to understand that the wastewater treatment plants themselves are not producing the, um, the PFAS. They are simply an area where, where PFAS is collecting and then being discharged through the environment. Um, so the surface water discharge is something that we're all familiar with when it, we talk about um, uh, discharging from a wastewater treatment plant. Spray irrigation, as I mentioned, is becoming more of a common practice here on the Eastern Shore, uh, a method that um, spray irrigates the, the treated effluent onto, onto farm fields. And then thirdly, the, the land application of biosolids. And I'll say um, biosolids, not all the biosolids that are generated in the, in the country even are land applied, but about 55% of them are. 30% uh, of them are landfilled, and then another 15% are incinerated, burned. So, all right, so we're understanding this. And before I get to my next slide, I want to play on the, the, the storyline here. So we saw the results from the State Department saying our fish aren't contaminated. We're getting some other results from our waterways showing that we do have um, PFAS entering the environment through some of these discharge sources. And then, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen, the influx of media from around the country really showing that how other areas, other landscapes are being impacted um, by the use of either the spray irrigation or the land application of biosolids. And so what, what sort of drew my attention first was up in Maine, um, I thought it was pretty significant to see a, a do not eat advisory issued for deer that were, um, that were tested up in Maine for um, concerns of high level of PFAS in the deer. You know, I think about the Eastern shore and right along with um, crabbing and oystering, you know, hunting is, is um, equally as high of, a, of, of an interest for a lot of the folks over here. And so, you know, when we're messing with deer, that, that can really um, impact a lot of our families. But specifically, what I started learning is that these deer that they were testing that had high levels of PFAS were tied back to grazing on top of fields where biosolids and, and other sludge material were applied um, for some time in the past. And so here I'm starting to make the connection. You know, it's not in our fish yet, but we're seeing it in the water. We're seeing it on farm fields and other places around the country. What's going on locally here? So I'll just scroll through a few other headlines that that really stunned me. This was from Michigan in, in the Detroit News, again, talking about deer and, and fish. Um, here's one coming from Wisconsin, I, I'm sorry, Michigan again. <clears throat> Another one um, talking about the do not eat advisory up in Maine. And then we're getting down into the aquatic life. And so in Florida, a lot of testing was done on um, shellfish, specifically oysters and, and clams. And we're seeing, you know, now we're seeing a direct impact to the industries that rely on, on, the, on the land and the resources here. The, the commercial fishing industry, in this case, the, the clamming industry, um, we're seeing recalls of products and then, you know, oysters and, and so on. So, again, these are examples from elsewhere in the country. I'm not claiming that we have data to support this in Maryland at this time. Um, but if anything, you know, we can learn from our neighbors and, and friends around the country and figure out how we can best approach sort of the monitoring and, and addressing this, this issue. So bringing it back locally here, um, Brent and I, we've been working in preparation of the one of the bills that um, Betsy will talk about. We've been really trying to get an understanding of, okay, if biosolids are a, a, a the transport of PFAS, you know, from the wastewater treatment plants, from the industries to the wastewater treatment plants to our farm fields. What's the situation look like here in Maryland? And so, doing um, some research and, and pulling state permits, we were able to determine that there's about 1,100 1, permits in the state of Maryland um, issued for the land application of biosolids. And those are the red dots that you see on the map here, um, broken out per county. 
And when you look at that, you, you can identify the hotspots. You can see where a lot of concentration of these permits are um, on the Eastern shore in the, the lower Western shore, and then um, out West near, near Frederick, Frederick County and Cumberland. And here's the, the sort of breakdown on the left. And what these permits were also able to tell us is about how much acreage of land biosolids are being applied to. And so here's another chart that sort of breaks it out by county, how much land is um, being used for, for the land application of biosolids. And if I zoom into to my home region over here on the Eastern shore of the, the 17,800 acres of land where biosolids are, are being applied or have been applied, um, about 44% of that is on the Eastern shore. And so we're recognizing that on the Eastern shore, the, the, um, the use of biosolids has been a practice that um, people have been doing for years. Uh, I'll say that, um, you know, there is a benefit of reusing nutrients. And, you know, this isn't to point the finger at anybody because I think we're just learning now of what um, potential contamination can result from the use of biosolids. But I'll say, you know, there, there's very much a, a beneficial reuse mindset when we have nutrients that could be used safely um, in the agricultural landscape. And so, again, this isn't to point fingers at anybody. It's just understanding now that we know more than we did in the past. And so now we need to figure out, you know, how do we protect our, our rivers, our land, and quite frankly, our people from um, the contamination of PFAS. So laying all that out there, you know, the pathways that, that we've identified there are, are largely coming from wastewater treatment plants and, and their outputs. Um, one thing to note too, if I jump back, when we looked at the permits on the Eastern shore, you know, I noted that we don't have a lot of wastewater treatment plants that are um, being fed by chemical um, industries or by suspected um, sources of PFAS. But what we did learn is that a lot of biosolids are transported to the Eastern shore from other parts of the state and even outside of the state. And so, you know, there becomes a sort of an accounting and figuring out, you know, okay, how can we trace this back to the potential source so we can begin addressing it? And I think the, the issue that, or the challenge that we have ahead of us is that a lot of this biosolids are commingled when they're transported to the agricultural field for use. And that makes it very hard to pull back and figure out what is the specific um, treatment plant or source in, uh, before the treatment plant that's contributing to it. So that's my overview on, on the potential pathways. Um, I'll leave you with this before I turn it over to Betsy. You know, what do I think about what when I think about what we need to be doing, um, understanding that, you know, we're just starting to learn about the contamination of this, but we've got a lot of examples from others around the country. Um, I think the first and, and most important thing is that we just need to be monitoring this. We need to be monitoring our wildlife. We need to be monitoring our seafood, um, our farmlands, and most importantly, our wastewater treatment plants. So then we can start backing up from there and figuring out where it is. And I'd advocate that, you know, states need to dedicate more funding for this. We continue to hear about the lack of approved protocols. So we need to get that figured out. And we need to make sure that we have certified testing procedures that are approved and, and um, tested. And then again, we need to be testing all the different avenues for uh, that are being impacted. Um, once we once we monitor, we need to, to look at ways to eliminate the pathways to the environment. You know, Brent talked about it perfectly. We have to put a wrench in that cycle. You know, if, if we don't figure out where we can be effective in the PFAS cycle, then the, the further down the cycle it gets, the more impact it's going to have. And so let's figure out where we can be most impactful there. And then lastly, you know, again, to say that you know, no one is necessarily at fault for, for using, you know, biosolids as a nutrient source um, for drinking their water, what have it but we need to make sure that those that are impacted, that resources are being put to helping them, you know, to making sure that farmland that, that has been contaminated with PFAS, you know, has a plan for, for remediating it and, and assisting those, those farmers um, as well as well water users and all the way down to the, the fisher, fishermen and, and hunters and, you know, our, our outdoor recreation based industries. So, 
I'll leave it at that. Um, there's an email. If anyone wants to connect after this and, and talk more, please jot that down and, and feel free to reach out. And Betsy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Matt and Brent, and um, great info from both of you. These are the two folks I rely on more than anyone else to give me really detailed information on testing and protocols and things that go a little bit over my lawyer head. Um, so I'm going to start just a little bit with how the heck did we get here? How did we end up in a situation where PFAS chemicals are pretty much everywhere? Um, they've been used, as Brent said, since the 1940s. There's good documentation that as of the 1970s, but potentially before that, there was uh, scientific data and information showing potential harm to humans from exposure to them. The Federal Drug Administration looked at um, studying harms to humans from ingesting and exposure and were convinced by industry at the time well, what if we just used a little bit less of these chemicals? And the FDA said, okay, we won't study it. So what we have been doing is using all of these products for decades and decades and building it into so many of our systems that it's really difficult to unwind this now. Um, but that's where we are. <laughs> so we have a pretty big challenge ahead of us. Fortunately, we're starting to get some much wider acknowledgement across government that this is a big issue and that needs to be addressed. EPA recently in 2021 came out with their PFAS action plan, looking at what they want to do over the next few years to study this, to classify, to potentially consider regulations in some areas. One big hole that we see in that plan is that the regulation and, and exposure minimization is focused on drinking water. Well, of course, that makes sense in lots of ways, right? We don't want to be drinking this. But it's not stopping it from getting put into the water and getting put onto our fields and getting put into the products we're using. And so our state level efforts are primarily focused on filling that gap. There are organizations, not ours, that work more at that federal level on things like the PFAS Protection Act, which I think has a new name now. But there are groups working on that, on that federally. We are not though we do coordinate with them and provide on the ground information. So we have to get a handle on the problem. We are doing some testing as Brent and Matt have done. The state of Maryland, state of Virginia, um, even our neighbors, Pennsylvania and West Virginia have been doing some testing. There are scientists actually on this call, I saw a few of your names, that we have relied on data from in reports looking at things like fish tissue samples. What we are seeing um, verifies our concerns that it's all over the place, even in ones where you wouldn't expect it to be there. Certain watersheds where you don't see industries or wastewater treatment plants, you test in the creek and there's still PFAS. How did it get there? So that's what we're really focused on right now. We had worked on legislation that has actually been pulled back because there's a plan to address it with the new administration in Maryland. But what it would have required is testing of all wastewater treatment plants. They're effluent. So that's both the water that comes out of a wastewater treatment plant as well as the biosolids, which Matt was talking about. And just assuming for a moment, not everybody on this call is as steeped in conversations about poop as river keepers are. I'll give you like a little tiny what wastewater treatment plants, kind of big picture partial treatment, you separate out the water from the solids. These are your sewer systems, right? This is what's human waste, but then you also get a lot of um, stormwater and different uses within your household 
are going to go to these treatment plants. So the solids, they're not not treated at all, but they're just partially treated to address bacteria. They are often sold off as a fertilizer for farm fields. Some of them are sold off for consumer uses, uses as a compost. For example, somebody mentioned Montgomery County in the chat. There was a recent article about the bloom um, that's being sold, which are biosolids that can be used as compost, and it's showing very high PFAS levels. Again, another thing that was mentioned in the chat is wastewater treatment plants sample what comes out of their effluent. They do, but they sample for what's in their permit. And currently there are no across the board standards for sampling for PFAS in these wastewater treatment plant permits. So that's, EP, that's what EPA put out in guidance, not in regulation. December of 2022, that we need to figure out what's coming out of these wastewater treatment plants before we know what to do about all of these chemicals coming through, because we want to stop it there before it's getting back into the river and then onto our land through the use of the biosolids. And I think that that's really consistent with all of our viewpoint on these uh, these chemical methods of exposure is stop it at the source. Um, it's not going to be that much different in a cost overall to treat it at the source versus treating it when it gets over to our drinking water facilities. And cost obviously is a big element here, but this is where we have the aha moment from the bipartisan infrastructure law that is providing massive amounts of money to states to address those costs. And actually, uh, I did not know the timing was going to work this way, but yesterday there were a bunch of announcements about grants on it. Two billion nationwide is being provided in federal funding to address PFAS, chemicals and contamination in states. And locally, uh, 18.9 million is going to Maryland. Um, I'm pretty sure the Virginia number was very similar to that, but I failed to write it down. So, um, but that just went out in press releases. What we have to do is first identify the problem. What's coming out of these facilities? And that's the bill that we had worked on with uh, Delegate Sarah Love and Senator Sarah Elfrith, who have worked on PFAS legislation that has been successful in the state before. Again, we withdrew the legislation because the administration in Maryland has said they want to do this voluntarily. Right now, they're looking, they're already requiring um, some testing at 23 wastewater treatment plants. Uh, that's uh, about a third of the wastewater treatment plants in Maryland. It's focusing on the large ones and or those that have reason for where they have a reason to believe there may be larger concentrations, for example, near Andrews Air Force Base, uh, military facility, military facilities have a lot of firefighting foam and have other uses where they historically have a lot of PFAS contamination coming off of them. They are requiring at these facilities that they test both that water effluent as well as the biosolids and that these will this testing requirement will become part of their permits on the renewal cycles. That's every five years. We'd like to see it a little quicker than that, but hopefully we can work with the administration to speed that up a bit, particularly for those that need more um, have already shown some contamination levels of concern so that we're getting that really dialed in and understanding what's coming off of them. But I just want to flag the what's next part of this that we also need to be thinking about that we're going to have to do something once we figure out all of that contamination might be coming off of these sources. And there's a few ways to get at that. There are technologies being developed. This is not my expertise, but, but we know people who work on that that could be used for getting it out of those systems. But you can also look up the chain. 
where is that discharge of PFAS coming into the wastewater treatment plant? Obviously, if it's residential users and our home products like the cooking materials and our Gore-Tex and waterproof on our couches and carpets and stuff, that <laughs> household by household, it's going to be a little tricky. Um, but if it's an industrial user, they have what's called pretreatment, where that user um, can potentially get it out of their system before it goes into the larger wastewater treatment plant. But that's... You know, that's a lot of layers here, and that's what we're really going to need to get on top of with this. Um, I, in order to really fix the problem, we're going to be looking at federal, state um, layers of requirements, and perhaps even some um, local government ones where there are particularly identified needs uh, through local contamination sources or overburdened communities that don't necessarily have as effective a regional or statewide system for removing the waste. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the complexity with biosolids. Because they are used as fertilizer and put on farm fields as well as some gardens, etc. We've had generations of people applying PFAS chemicals unknowingly to their fields. So the next step we need to go is not just looking at the biosolids, but are there accumulation of these solids in fields? Um, oh, sorry, PFAS in the fields where they're applying. Um, I'm sure in some instances there will not be, but in others there will. And what do we do about that? I think it's really important to think proactively about how this could impact some farming communities um, with a burden that they didn't bring on themselves. Again, that's why we're very excited to see federal funding available for this kind of treatment. And I think we need to be thinking proactively about getting to the point of the solutions, part of ensuring that we're not just continuing this cycle of exposure of PFAS and spreading it around our communities again and again. And while I'm talking about spreading PFAS around, um, a, another bill that we are working on with our partners over at the Smart on Pesticides Network is a registration requirement for pesticides, in particular those spread for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, as we all know, like water. So when you're trying to control the population, you are often spraying those chemicals where they do get into our waterways. Um, so this would require that they test those, um, those pesticides for PFAS before they can register it for use in the state, just to ensure that we're not yet again adding spray um, and adding these PFAS chemicals straight sometimes into our drinking water systems. Potomac River provides drinking water for millions of people in the, in the DC area. Patuxent's another big source. The gunpowder up above Baltimore, you know, these these rivers are our drinking water sources. So that is the, the most important place that we can try and ensure that we're keeping it out of us, out of exposure to all of us. Um, so that bill is coming up. I have an action alert I can put in the chat here. Yes. If anyone wants to sign on in support of that. But we are really looking again at the what we consider the kind of the hole in the system of ensuring that we're stopping it at the sources. Um, I'm going to stop there because I want to allow some opportunity for questions, but um, thank everyone for coming and hopefully this has been helpful. All right. Um... I'm going to start with a few questions that were asked um, when people registered. Um, then we'll get some questions in the chat. But we have some time for both. Um, so there's a couple questions about whether similar legislation is being considered in Virginia. Betsy, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yes, uh, Virginia did put forward. So Virginia had a really good legislation put forward in 2020 that required study committee and then um, recommendations from that, which has resulted in pretty extensive testing. Now, again, theirs has been focused around their drinking water systems, but they do have really good data from that testing. There, there was legislation this term put forward in Virginia that would look at the wastewater treatment plants. Um, I think it probably won't pass, <laughs> but, um, but there is a push there. I, I did hear some really good conversations amongst legislators about concern and recognizing we need to do more um, both in Virginia and Maryland on this. So uh, keeping fingers crossed that maybe it'll get through this session in Virginia. If not, we'll, we'll be working on it next year as well. Great, thanks Betsy. Um, there is a question actually about Charles County. So how much PFAS testing has been done in Charles County? What's being done in regards to environmental cleanup uh, in Charles County potentially? And it, it, you know, what funding is being provided to communities that may suffer from contamination or illness due to PFAS? Kind of a multi-part question there. <laughs> I cannot tell you the exact specifics on Charles County, though I could follow up if you want to. Um, I, I just don't have that at my fingertips. What I can tell you is Charles County has a lot of different sources, um, including the Morgantown facility and coal ash and other issues there. Under both the state revolving loan fund and the bipartisan infrastructure law, there will be funding available for communities to help address these concerns. The, what that program looks like is still a little bit fuzzy right now, but we'd be happy to send out some information and more specifics on it as we get a few more uh, guardrails and so we know what it looks like. I don't know if um, Brent or Matt had more on Charles than that. Yeah, I don't have anything specific on the, in Charles County, um, you know, but it is down there and uh, heavily um, industrialized and residentialized uh, area. And I know there's, you know, Piscataway Creek and pretty, I'm not sure if that's been mentioned or not um, with the military base that's been on Piscataway Creek. It's been noted to have extremely high levels of PFAS probably the highest levels of PFOS in that nationwide study done by Waterkeeper Alliance and all the river keepers collected samples. And there is a fish consumption advisory, the first one in Maryland for PFOS um, in Piscataway Creek. And that's something that we we're really interested in trying to push for other areas because I've done some monitoring uh, up in the upper Potomac and done some work to get to blaze with USGS, uh, who's got some information on smallmouth bass having 500,000 uh, parts per trillion of PFOS in the plasma of the fish, you know, and lower, a little bit lower levels will probably be in the fish tissue. Uh, but that just goes to show that these the fish that we consume, the fish that we catch, the fish that is in our rivers and streams do have high levels of PFOS. And there's been, there needs to be a warning sent out to the public. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, there's a couple questions about um, synthetic turf, field, turf fields. Um, is there anything that you know we're doing or you've been seeing that's been happening basically um, to address PFAS in synthetic turf fields? Uh, not that I know of specifically yet, but I know that that is on the list. I mean, it, first and foremost, people were looking at uh, military or the Federal government and states are looking at military bases because that's where AFFF was used for decades. And then it's gone to drinking water, um, you know, public drinking water facilities. And now it's being looked at uh, at um, various different product uses. Um, bile cells is probably next on the list, you know, and then it's working itself all into all the different facets of where PFOS could be. Uh, and TURP is definitely one of them. Um, so it's it's just a matter of time where we, before we start to get an idea of where all the PFOS is. And that's why we are pushing monitoring. We have got to monitor because those uh, facilities that grow the turf that gets transported to homes and properties, they're, you know, they're using various different products that could have PFOS in it. They're, they're using biocells to grow the grass root grass and have PFOS in it. So, uh, that is something that you know we're very interested in trying to follow up on with more information. Great. 
um you know there was a some some chat in the in the chat about this but i don't know if you wanted to add anything brent maybe about um disposal of pfas products and if you have any recommendations of what to do with disposal you know how to dispose of them you know disposal is going to be our achilles heel it really is um you know there's a lot of research right now into developing various different disposal methods breakdown methods how do we break down this chain how do we uh, break it down into inert products that can be easily disposed of and not have any kind of contamination impacts to the environment. Um, and there is some promising research out there, but it's not been able to be produced at large scale. And so, you know, we're going to be like kicking the can down the road. We're putting our biosolids into landfills. We're putting products into landfills. Uh, and then it's going to be a matter of time before we have to treat that leachate that has PFOS in it. Um, in, in trying to remove the PFAS. So there's really no easy answer. I wish there was an easy answer. If you have an attic that you want to store all this PFAS stuff and, and maybe in 10 years, when there's a way to, dis, to dispose of it, go for it. Other than that, I really, there's not much I can tell you. It's just try and limit what gets into our rivers and streams and what gets into your body. Uh, and from that point on, it's, it's just a matter of trying to push the envelope of research and hopefully the states and federal government will, will do something down the road. Great. Um, there was a question about how do we treat our contaminated soils? Yeah, I did answer a little bit on that. Um, there, is, there are methods of what's called soil washing, but these are usually employed at very um, toxic sites, you know, industrial sites uh, for, and, they, and it's been used um, for a couple of decades now uh, for other pollutants, other toxic pollutants. But again, it is focused on those high level um, sites, landfills, industrial sites. It it's really hasn't been employed or used on farm fields uh, or um, residential property. So there is no convenient way of removing that um, PFOS from soils in very small quantities. And, smaller areas like that at least uh, at least not right now there's uh you know it's it's in the environment and at, over time it will flush out of uh, the soils um and there are ways of removing that flushing uh by sucking out the groundwater and then treating the groundwater that's been done in several cases across the country several toxic areas but uh, so that's another route to go uh, again, it's just it's just going to take time for this stuff. As soon as we can put all the wrenches in all the different cycles and stop it from getting into the environment and into our products, um, then this stuff will slowly dissipate over time. But that's going to take a while. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, I think, you know, we're basically out of time right now. So I think we're going to end it there unless anyone has any final questions for uh, our speakers. I'm going to let everyone go um so thank you so much i wouldn't be a good development officer even if i only have a couple of days left if i didn't um you know obviously advocate for everyone joining our efforts whether that's volunteering with us um whether that's donating um you know you uh, doing the action alert that betsy sent any of those ways to you know show your support for the work that we do the work that chop tank and short rivers does um both are awesome both are great um so we really appreciate it. Um, like I said before, the recording um, will be sent out to everyone. Um, so and if you didn't, you know, if you missed some of it at the beginning or at the end, um, hopefully you can you know, watch it all. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys thank you Emily. We will miss you. <laughs> I'll miss everyone, too. Thank you so much, guys. Bye now. Have a great day. Thank you.